Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what the hell is going on. So do you believe that uh, Islam is consistent with the Constitution? Uh, no, I don't. I do not. I, I would not advocate that we put a Muslim in charge of this nation. I absolutely would not agree with that. But how is targeting Muslim neighborhoods constitutional? Now, what we should be targeting is radical Islamic terrorism and the political correctness of this administration. They refuse to acknowledge that we are facing a global jihad from radical Islamic terrorism. Indeed, after just about every one of these attacks, whether Paris, whether San Bernardino, and certainly coming after Brussels, President Obama goes on national television and lectures Americans on Islamophobia. I think Islam hates us. There's something, there's something there that there's a tremendous hatred there. There's a tremendous hatred. We have to get to the bottom of it. There is an unbelievable hatred of us. My name is Faraz Hamdani, and I am an American Muslim. As an American Muslim, I go to work. I enjoy spending time with my family, my friends, and going out to eat, just like any other American would. But then why is it that because of my faith, I'm the subject of so much discrimination, of questioning and mistrust, of outright animosity? Why is it that the current political landscape and media narrative pick such selective sound bites, portraying only the most negative aspects they can about Islam? Why is it that I'm being forced to question my own position in the community that I've lived and grown up in. This has all prompted me to ask, how long have Muslims been in America? What is the story of Islam in the United States? What are Muslims doing today, and how are they integrated into society? Join me as I investigate these questions and more to understand what is the history of Muslims in America? What are they doing today, and what does their future hold? Muslims are actually one of the fabrics of this society. I mean, if you look at the Islam in this country, it came with slavery. Uh, and there, are, there have been Muslims in this country for a long time, and then there will be Muslims in this country. And if you look at the polls, Muslims are like average Americans, you know, I mean, income level wise, education wise. Uh, so indeed, many of the Muslims are quite educated. They are serving this country. We have Muslims who are firefighters. We are Muslims who are in the army, and some of them are actually laying in Arlington Cemetery right now, who fought for this country. We have Muslims who are doctors. We have Muslims who are engineers. I think all these messages, to a certain degree hateful messages and bigotry uh, sent by the, uh, our politicians, don't uh, bring the right message that we are needing in these days. I think uh, those politicians need to send messages that are unifying us rather than dividing us. Uh, and especially in this Islamophobic environment, those messages uh, not only hurt the Muslims, but also pose danger to the Muslims. If you are you know, living in a community under a state, you have to basically abide the laws of that state, and then you have to follow the rulers of that state. So Muslims living in this country basically understand that they are living in America, they follow the rules, they are under the, the state, they are under this government, and then they all they want to do is actually have a peaceful life in this country and raising families. So I think what I want to see from our politicians is sending, our, sending the messages that are unifying this country other than dividing it. We just had a chance to see one of the newer communities at the Dianet Center. As that community continues to grow and to flourish, we're reminded that there are multiple communities spread across America, from the East Coast to the West Coast and throughout Central America. These communities are all made out of professionals, students, families, children and elders. These communities share one thing in common, their faith and their religious beliefs in Islam. What surprises me still is the political landscape that these local Muslim communities are thriving under. With presidential candidates like Donald Trump, Ben Carson, and Ted Cruz, the Muslim communities are largely being marginalized and alienated. These candidates are purporting views and beliefs and a faith system that they largely do not understand. Whether through our general awareness or our denial, the concept of Islamophobia has rampantly grown in recent years. Is Islamophobia real? What exactly is Islamophobia and how serious is it? 
To understand Islamophobia in a little bit more detail, we're going to head over to talk to Corey Saylor, Director of CARE. Now, Corey's experience will hopefully help us understand what exactly is Islamophobia, and is it a recent phenomenon, or is it something that's contributed and existed in society for many years? Any reasonable human being responds to the type of violence and rhetoric we've seen targeting the Muslim community by becoming a little more cautious. You're more aware of your surroundings. You come to work every day in a building where doors are kept locked, an entire floor is locked off from the outside world because there's a concern that someone may bring a gun to the office and try to kill you all. To a degree, I, I work here because I like to be part of the shield that protects the Muslim community and I recognize that death threats from the far right, death threats from Daesh are part of the work and it makes me proud that us getting targeted means other Muslims can go about their daily lives, hopefully in a little bit less fear. Typically there's four things that feed anti-Muslim sentiment in the United States. First and foremost are groups that claim that Islam sanctions the atrocities they commit. You can never overlook that. <clears throat> then you have to understand the media, and research shows this very clearly, the media gives those violent extremist groups a central spokesperson position for the entire faith. So a group called Media Tenor that does research on coverage of Islam has clearly shown that more than two-thirds of the coverage in the United States about Islam is negatively slanted. Then you have politicians who exploit the current fear of Islam in this country for their own political purposes. So Donald Trump, Ted Cruz, Bobby Jindal, Rick Santorum, the list unfortunately is endless of people who have decided to exploit fear to try to gain votes and money. And then the last of those four sort of key points is the U.S. Islamophobia Network. So this is a group of organizations, 33 of whom are full-time dedicated to doing nothing but spreading fear of Islam in this country and who we know have available to them between 2008-2013 in excess of $200 million in total revenue. So when you combine those four factors, you get, unfortunately, the atmosphere you have in the United States right now, which is one where Islam is vilified and seen as an object of fear. Camp is the French camp. Why is it that no one within the Muslim community there in France knew what these guys were up to? Because it seems to me that this was a pretty big plan. Surely someone beyond the seven guys who were being killed over the last 48 hours would have to have known something, and that was probably within the Muslim community, but yet no one said anything. We see all these acts of terrorism, all these terrorist groups. It's all done in the name of Islam, the desire to wipe Israel off the map. We see this group ISIS convert or die. Why, why do I sense there's not enough outspoken Muslims saying, you know, we condemn this. This is not our religion. Stop doing acts of terror in the name of our religion. I don't hear those voices that loudly. ISIS is Islamic, is it not? Given the fact that the finger of blame is pointed at the Muslim community, rightly or wrongly, does that not shift you into a situation where the Muslim community and the leaders should step up and take a greater role in looking at the young people and the roads that they're going down? You have to accept that responsibility to prevent the bigger backlash that comes your way when these things happen. Then you have entire countries where women are forced to cover. It's a very common practice. Are you where, denying where? that? You know, I, okay. I, I, where, where? In, I, I, even I in Egypt, in, when the I, Muslim I Brotherhood in was Lebanon. in charge, Saudi Arabia, uh, we can go to yes, Iran, okay. we can go to Turkey. Women, uh, even under their their own households, if they are no, married they're... to a strict Islamist, then they're going to have to do things like that. You know, I'm yet to hear, uh, you know, the condemnation from the Muslim community on this. But I mean, I, you know, see. again, the point he's making is it's not our fault. But the fact of the matter is when these things happen, the finger of blame is pointed at the Muslim community. And so you have to be preemptive. It's coming from the community. The word responsibility comes yeah, to mind. It just comes to mind. You, you can't shirk that. I would argue that in many ways the media in the United States today has become an advertising industry. And a 
productive conversation about how Daesh murders more Muslims than they do any people of any other faith and how that puts the overwhelming majority of Muslims around the world uh, in line and on the same side as the United States and other countries that are pushing back against terrorism. That conversation will never make it onto TV. But a crazy guy in some cave in Afghanistan waving a sword and yelling death to America is guaranteed multiple news cycles. And that's because more people are going to watch the crazy guy. So it's not really that he's more important to the conversation or that he's really news. It's that that's what generates eyes on the TV screen, which is what makes advertising revenue. Oklahoma voters approved it. But tonight, one of those state questions is in jeopardy. The Council on American Islamic Relations, along with local religious and civil rights leaders today, announced a lawsuit against what they call an anti Islam ballot measure. State question 755 passed in Tuesday's election. The measure forbids judges from considering Islamic law or international law when deciding any cases in Oklahoma. It passed the state Senate and House by huge margins. On Tuesday, voter after voter after voter, 70% did the same. But now a lawsuit has been filed to stop state question 755 from ever taking effect. Anytime any minority is told they do not have the same rights as the majority I feel compelled to speak up. Munir filed the lawsuit in question. His supporters at this crowded press conference say the state question banning Sharia law merely promotes pointless bigotry against Muslims. The lawsuit's unfounded. It's not necessary. Lewis Moore, one of the question's primary authors, condemns the lawsuit and calls 755 a preemptive action to protect the Constitution. If they want to live in America, they need to be Americans, and they need to adapt to the American culture. What Islamophobia is doing is causing Americans to back away from constitutional principles and the laws that we have on the books. One example, in 2010, Oklahoma passed a bill that specifically forbade judges in that state from considering Islamic religious principles and rulings. So if I had gotten married under Islamic law and I had promised my wife a certain amount of money as part of our arrangement and then later we're getting divorced and I just didn't pay that money, my wife would have had no recourse to go to the courts to get what she was owed. That so many people would support outlawing consideration of Islam and violation of the First Amendment is really troubling. And you see it in this election cycle in exit polls again and again and again in Republican primaries. People are being asked about banning Muslims from coming into this country. And something on the order of about an average of about 69 percent of people are responding yes, absolutely. Which again, complete and totally undermines the First Amendment. You've had through a couple of election cycles now, this time by Ben Carson, uh, the idea put forward that a Muslim should never be the President of the United States, even though Article 6 of the U.S. Constitution says there is no religious test for public office, meaning your religion doesn't matter. Throughout my trip here in Washington, D.C., we've heard a variety of facts, opinion, and experiences that frankly paint quite a disparaging image for Muslims in America. This image is plagued with animosity, distrust, and fear, all of which is being widely promoted in the current presidential candidacy race. Presidential candidates vying to sit in the White House here right behind us for arguably the most powerful position in the world. These presidential candidates are spewing anti-Muslim rhetoric and fear-mongering. It is damaging not only to the image of Muslims in America, but to the very moral fibers that this country was founded on. While here in Washington, D.C., we'd like to talk to Rahat Hussain of Ummah to just understand what really are the positions of these candidates? Why are they promoting such negative messaging? And how damaging is it really to the United States? The controversy surrounding Muslims is that uh, a few candidates, particularly on the Republican side, have made it a basis of their campaign to demonize Muslims. Uh, and they've gained great popularity uh, by doing so. And so the cycle continues. The more popular they get, they become that popular because they've demonized Muslims. Uh, the more they demonize Muslims, the more popular they get. Uh, a few examples of this are uh, Dr. Ben Carson, whose campaign was very strongly struggling until he made an offhand comment uh, insulting Muslims, and then his popularity rose 
uh, dramatically until he was challenging uh, Donald Trump. Donald Trump has made it his regular business to say all sorts of demonizing things and Islamophobic, Islamophobic comments about Muslims. Uh, and he's a front runner. Uh, and he is a front runner because he's been attacking Muslims. Muslims actually enjoy a pretty good relationship with the US government as it is uh, under uh, President Obama. Uh, in fact, uh, in the last year, year and a half, President Obama has met with various Muslim groups, including uh, the largest Shia Muslim group in the United States, Ummah, uh, to talk about uh, the Muslim experience in America and our thoughts and concerns. Uh, other departments, other cabinets, they're, they're also doing the same under President Obama's direction. So you generally see that Muslims are able to get their issues addressed and their thoughts and concerns heard uh, at the highest levels of the U.S. government. So the relationship right now is, is quite good. Uh, but the concern is if another party or an anti-Muslim or Islamophobic candidate uh, becomes the president or achieves a high-level office, that that relationship could change uh, very dramatically. The Muslims have been a part of the American story since the very beginning. Many of the slaves were Muslim. Uh, there were Muslim and Arab newspapers in Washington, D.C. Uh, in the early 1800s. There were six of them. Uh, it shows there was a large population of Muslims. Uh, early presidents and early politicians referenced uh, the role of Muslims uh, in being allies of the United States. So Muslims are not new or foreign or just immigrants. Uh, we're an important part of American culture. And to fight Islamophobia, we have to be willing to accept that. We have to be willing to uh, understand that just because some of us are immigrants, just because some of us are new to the country, does not mean that Islam is new to the country. I think Islam hates us. There's something, there's something there that there's a tremendous hatred there. There's a tremendous hatred. We have to get to the bottom of it. There is an unbelievable hatred of us. In, in Islam body. itself? Uh, you're gonna have to figure that out, okay? After hearing about Islamophobia today, I did a little bit of my own research trying to understand just how the media is portraying Islam and Muslims, it's alarming and frightening to see just how aggressively Muslims are being attacked. They're being attacked in a way that makes Muslims and Islam seem alien, frightening, new, and strange. But this certainly can't be the case. Upon a little bit further research, I discovered the Islamic Heritage Museum in Washington, D.C. I'll be going to see Amr Muhammad of the museum to understand just how long Muslims have been here and how they've been integrated. We've been a museum for the last 20 years. We established this museum back in 1996. We was a museum without walls. First it was an idea, first it was the word. It took time for that word to take on flesh, to get on bones. One of the most misperceptions that people give you, especially now in America, they say what? What they say? America is built on uh, uh, the Christian value. No, sir. No, sir. America was not built on Judeo-Christian value. Now I'm speaking as a Christian, coming from a Christian family that come to Islam. We was taught as Christians, do not kill, do not steal, do not backbite, do not covenant someone else's wife or somebody else's thing. They stole us from our country, from our land. They killed us. That's not Christian. Desire what we had. That's not Christian, so don't tell me it was built on uh, uh, today Christian value. They were built upon the freedom of religion. They fought for the freedom of religion. So me, you, and everybody else could practice their form of faith, their form of belief. That is what America was built upon, the freedom of religion. We're here today in the Islamic Heritage Museum in Washington, D.C. with exhibits and artifacts dating as far back as the 1300s and the early expeditions. And right here on this wall, you'll see copies of original letters and transcripts with Arabic writing on them uh, from, from Job Solomon and others uh, seeking freedom from, from slavery at the time. Before America was America, there was the Great Revolutionary War where the colonized Americans were fighting for their independence and freedom from Great Britain. Did you know that during that time there were many Muslim soldiers and leaders in, within the Revolutionary Army? One of which was Yusuf Ben Ali, who was then known as Joseph Ben Haley, and he fought alongside the general in battles down in South Carolina. 
We also have Ampit Muhammad, who was a corporal in the Revolutionary War in his army. His service records indicate a service date of almost 10 years. Here, we have reproduced letters from the Sultan of Morocco acknowledging America as a country and establishing the first peace treaty America ever had with a country, and it happened to be a Muslim country. The first ex uh, exposure of Muslims in America really dates back, really to the honest truth, back in the ninth century um, with the um, Chinese Muslim coming over here. But then you come into more of a documented and re records start appearing in the 1312 with a man saw Musa's brother, Abu Bakr, these West Africans made two journeys over here into the Western Hemisphere. Wound up going through the Mississippi, South America, Panama, Cuba, all these regions. Matter of fact, they say that they're the ones that gave them um, the name Honolulu and Hawaii are Islamic African names. And there's other reports. You find reports with Christopher Columbus when he arrived here, talking about seeing rooms over in Panama and Cuba of old masters and old mosques. But even prior to that, you look at uh, before Columbus came and before the fall of Granada, they thought the world was flat. It wasn't until 1492 when they got, found the maps at the fall of Granada that they went on a journey to travel. And they realized that Muslims was traveling, that the world wasn't flat, that the world was round. So you got these early documents about that. There's some professors, a lot of them out of Harvard. Uh, Ivan Van Sertiman wrote a book that came before Columbus. Barry Fells wrote a book, Saga of America. And he talked about finding old runes in the four corners of the United States. Then you have Ivan Van Sertiman. Uh, there was another pro professor who wrote a three, uh, uh, Clyde Winters, wrote a three uh, volume set of books talking about Africa's discovery of America. So there's early um, presence of Africans here. And you've seen some of the old rooms that you find around in the Western Hemisphere. It's interesting to see that there are clear examples of Islamic and Muslim presence in the earlier years of this country. We have instances of Mecca, Indiana, and Muhammad, Illinois. Various other cities have been named after either Islamic places or Islamic names. Many of these cities have retained those names, preserving not just the heritage of the Muslims that helped colonize or expand those areas, but continue to live there today. As you can see, there's tombstones here with Arabic writing and Quranic verses or prayers that are spread throughout the country. It's absolutely powerful to see the types of Muslim personalities that existed in the early years of this country. One example, Bill Ali Muhammad, also Ben Ali Muhammad, was an exceptional character. Brought here as a slave, he had a great foundation in his Islamic education. He began teaching fellow slaves and developed a community of Muslims amongst the slaves. His character spoke so highly that his owner made him a manager of the plantation. Now during this time, there was great turmoil with the British Empire. The War of 1812 was fast approaching and Ben Ali went to his owner and master and said, I have 80 men and people of faith ready to defend this land against the British. Now Ben Ali prayed five times a day, wore the Islamic garb, read the Quran and fasted during the month of Ramadan. So when Ben Ali says he has 80 men of faith ready to defend this land, it implies 80 men of Islamic belief. Wow. Yara Mahmud is documented as one of the oldest and first Muslims residing in Washington, D.C. He was brought here as a slave prior to the Revolutionary War. Through the strength of his character, he was able to work for and achieve his freedom. With that freedom, he became one of the most famous Muslims being an enterprising individual, establishing business, and building a community and helping establish what we now look at as Georgetown back in the 17 and 1800s. Here we have a copy of Yara Mahmud's will. The will begins with, in the name of God, Amen. Here we see that the Islamic influence didn't just facilitate itself through his life and his personal character, or his business, or his community involvement, but even the legal documents. Yara Mahmud's story is a compelling story because it shows the journey of the continuation of an enslaved African leaving West Africa in a traditional African society, one rooted in Islamic scholarship, not one a place just as a dusty, a fabled story place of Timbuktu or in Agadez, Niger, but of one of a rich Islamic tradition that had its own origin, its own way of looking at the world, and its role of seeing themselves as Muslims. Most scholars estimate that 20, upwards of 45% of the enslaved Africans came from West Africa. That means their rituals, their traditions were rooted in that West African Islamic experience. Yara Mahmud comes into the U.S. 
1752 on the slave ship called the Elijah. And he comes and we know through records that he in fact knew Arabic and Arabic probably was his third, fourth or fifth language. Him along with many others, uh, he gives the foundational elements for the establishment of Islam in America. So he comes on this slave ship called the Elijah. He comes in 1752, he's 16 years old when he was captured. He was enslaved in the U.S. for 44 years. That's a long time to be an enslaved African in America. And we know through records that he was able to uh, he assign his own deed in Arabic. This is another powerful thing. Again, it challenges the notions of Africans, enslaved Africans, not being able to read and write, carrying it to the New World, and the element of survival in very harsh conditions in the U.S. It's not, a it's not an easy place for an enslaved African in America. And he was able to get manumitted. He becomes free in one of the most uh, um, economically viable places in Washington called Georgetown. Right now, we are in the heart of Georgetown, Washington, D.C. Behind us is where the home of Yara Mahmoud was. Behind us, you can see right now that the house has been torn down and this was the site of the actual excavation done in the backyard where they pulled out artifacts and a history translating not just the life and times of Yara Mahmoud, but his Islamic faith and beliefs. Yara did not hide the fact that he was Muslim. It's noted that he wore traditional garb, carried rosary beads, and was often chanting or praying and was known to pray facing the east. Clear signs of his Islamic faith. It's interesting to think about that today where Muslims are largely in fear or afraid to display their faith and their belief outwardly in their local communities. He perhaps was buried in his backyard. And so I was part of that project where we were searching, we were digging and looking for his grave. I was praying that we found it. For some reason, part of my, my um, you know, personal connection, I felt really passionate to find his grave um, for him to get a proper burial because this would be a question, did he get a janazah prayer? Did he get a funeral prayer? James Alexander Simpson, Charles Wilson Peale, who have done renditions of other American presidents, did a picture painting of Yar Mahmoud. The question is, why would, why would, these, why would these American painters who were certainly well known in the larger public. Um, why would they do a picture of Charles Wilson? Or, or why would they do a picture of Yara Mahmoud? Um, I think that the, these are questions that we're, we're, we're posing and we're curious about. Earlier today, we had an opportunity to visit the Supreme Court. I was very surprised that inside there's a large statue or tablet of prominent historical figures that have contributed to the lawmaking ideologies or theories that doctrine our own United States. Within this tablet was one sculpture of the Prophet Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam. Now, within the court, they've documented that these lawmakers, Napoleon, Confucius, Moses, and Muhammad, among many others, hold similar ideologies and faiths and beliefs into how the law of the land should be governed. Even more evident in historical figures and leaders like Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, both of whom who are documented to have held copies of the Quran that they read frequently and were also diplomats to Muslim countries. Their experiences working with Muslims helped them to acknowledge that the common beliefs and ideologies shared with the Muslim faith and with the faith and freedom indoctrinated in the American Constitution are very, very similar. In 1850, in American census records, we found a, a Muhammad living in California from Arabia at the age of 28. We found in uh, Minnesota a guy named Peter Akbar from Canada. We found um, one guy named Henry Allah living in Ohio. It probably was a doula, but it says Henry Allah from Ireland. We found about seven different census records from people with Islamic names coming from Ireland. So I go Google Muslims in Ireland and say 1959. I said, it can't be. I see this document. So then we go Google Moors, find out the Moors conquered southern parts of Ireland early on. So now I wonder about these names, Odu, Otu, all these uh, names that we see. Are they have, do they have any Islamic roots from the Irish people? In 1892, 
or in the uh, Civil War, pardon me, there was over 292 people that had Islamic names. One had the name of Allah, two had the name Muhammad, a couple had Hameen. Uh, at least 292 people we saw that fought uh, in the Civil War. It's very fascinating to see the role Muslims played during the Civil War. Records indicate at least 292 Muslims served actively during the war. Some of the most interesting stories come from people like Muhammad Ali, who was a free man who was then enslaved, then freed and moved to Europe. And from Europe, he then chose to come to America. Coming to America and being well educated, he established a teaching facility. From there, he enlisted in the regiment, served during the Civil War, and then chose to move to the hospitals, where he learned medicine and helped treat wounded victims. During the Civil War, we also see some very interesting things on Islamic history and documentation. Unfortunately, one of the casualties of war is that many of the libraries and buildings were burnt down or torn down during the Civil War. What's fascinating, though, is upon going back to these sites, they're able to find an intact copy of the Quran, in this example, in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. This copy of the Quran indicates that they were practicing Muslims or they were studying the Islamic faith at that time in the United States in Alabama. Furthermore, inside the Quran they found genealogical trees indicating that the persons that may have read or utilized this Quran actually had family members dating back many generations that are likely to have also resided in the United States and been of Muslim or Islamic heritage. In America, in World War I, there was 550 people that had the last name Muhammad, spelled 41 different ways, M-U-M-A-M-O. A-D-E-D-E-T-I-T, -E -E 41 different ways to spell the name Muhammad. At the late turn of the century, you had the Father Ottoman Empire. And you see this in towns in the United States. Um, there's three that come to my mind uh, real quick. A town called Mecca, Indiana. It has a covered bridge that was built in 1873. Um, this is a town of about 300 people. Inside of this town, there's about two cemeteries. One cemetery they call the Arabia Cemetery. The other is a family cemetery called the Hickson Cemetery. Inside the Hickson Cemetery is where I found tombstones written in Arabic. As well in the Arabia Cemetery, where we found tombstones with the Tahid on it, with the one finger. You got Mecca, Indiana. Then you got the town of Muhammad, Illinois. Inside Muhammad, Illinois, they found uh, tombstones with the one finger on it. Now, they don't want that name, Muhammad, Illinois. They tried to change it to Middletown, but there was already a town called Middletown, so they had to go back to calling it Muhammad. And it's in Champaign Illinois, County, Illinois. It's the oldest county in Illinois. Matter of fact, there's reports that Abraham Lincoln spent the night in that town, Muhammad. While I was in that town, Muhammad, I was looking through the library and found out there was a guy that was born in Muhammad, was out in Texas, found out there was another town called Muhammad, Texas. This was established in 1850. They had a post office from 1857 to 1916, led by a guy named August Muhammad. Um, there have been mosques in the United States for hundreds of years. Currently, the longest standing mosque in the United States was built in the 1930s and is in Dearborn, Michigan. Now, these mosques weren't just religious centers. They were centers for public welfare and social justice. Right here in Washington, D.C., Masjid al-Muhammad was built in the 1960s by Elijah Muhammad with support from Malcolm X. These mosques served as centers that helped promote anti-discrimination, that fought for human rights and fought for civil rights. One of the first known European converts to Islam in America was Alexander Russell Webb. He played a very pivotal part in the development of Islam in America. During the late 1800s, the first world conference, essentially the first interfaith event held, was in Chicago. During this event, Alexander gave two lectures where he talked about the tenets of Islam. He went on to continue his career as a journalist, propagating not just the teachings of Islam in his work, but in his personal life.
here walking through Arlington National Cemetery. I'm overcome with just the, the gravity of, of the number of graves and soldiers we see here and surprised in a, in a grateful way to see the number of Muslim graves uh, amongst them all uh, as recent as the Iraq War and Muslim graves dating back 200 years and more uh, in, in previous wars up to the Civil War and uh, it's, it's amazing to see just how intrinsically everyone, regardless of faith, has been involved in, in building and maintaining and defending the freedom of this country. Just over, overwhelming. Today, the place of Islam and the place of Muslims in America is largely engulfed in uncertainty. The varying narratives we continue to hear and are exposed to are largely devoid of fact and of history. Here in Arlington National Cemetery in Washington, D.C., one thing is certain. The role Muslims have played in the history and foundation of the United States is largely either forgotten or unknown. Buried here are Civil War, World War I, and World War II veterans whose valor transcends the boundaries of ethnicity and religion. We commemorate their valor on their graves adorning stars, crosses, and crescents. As you can see, this whole room is dedicated to the Nation of Islam. Founded by Elijah Muhammad, the group gained a lot of momentum and popularity being tied very closely to the Civil Rights Movement. Prominent members and affiliates included Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali. Likely one of the most popular Muslim Americans in history, Muhammad Ali, the great boxer and the people's champ. Interestingly enough, early in his career, he was seen as very controversial and polarizing because he used his sports popularity to speak for issues like social justice and minority equal rights. One of the most prominent figures and icons in history, Malcolm X, embodied the very tenets of Islam, speaking out for social justice and civil reform. Malcolm X brought to the forefront many controversial issues that people weren't ready to talk about or didn't know how to talk about. And in doing so, he helped give the civil rights movement the momentum it so desperately needed. The founder, or the leader of the movement that Muhammad Ali had embraced, which was, we call him the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he passed in 1975. But he had always, from the very beginning, this is what's important about the movement that a lot of the foreign Muslims or migrant Muslims don't understand. From the very beginning, he, in Islam, proper Islam was embedded, although that was not the basic tenets at that time because it wouldn't work with the conditions of the people. It had to be something strange in, in, a, different, in a different approach. But the Quran, the pure Quran was given to him, and he always told the people that the Holy Quran, the same Quran that's over 1,400 years ago, was given to that community and said that this is the true, the perfect word of God. Keep it in a high place. Someone will teach you later. The one that come after me, this is what he said. He said, the one that will come after me, meaning his son, he will teach you the religion. My job is just to clean you up, to bring you into a state of dignity, uh, to prepare you for the religion. And so a lot of the morals were there. Uh, uh, Alice Haley, in his book, uh, said that Honorable Elijah Muhammad did something that none of the churches could do. He had more reform in America with pimps, prostitutes, drugs, dealers, uh, addicts, uh, prison reform, uh, uh, human decency, uh, stopping fornication and adultery, respect for yourself, he, he, uh, even, even cigarettes. Most of the Middle East can't even come off cigarettes. He got them to even come off cigarettes. In 1975, uh, Elijah Muhammad's son, Wallace Muhammad, uh, later changed his name to Walter Thadeen Muhammad, so but we'll say Wallace, uh, he did something at a time when it was unpopular. He picked up the American flag. The first imam in the history of America to pick up the American flag. And he had a big audience in front of him. And he said this, he said, if you all won't pick it up, I will. When he picked that flag up and said, if you all won't pick it up, I will. And then he said, we have an obligation. And he was drawing from the words of Muhammad the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he said, if you are a citizen, whether you are a majority or a minority, but if you are a minority in a country that you claim citizenship in, you have an obligation. So what I'm saying, he got this from Muhammad the Prophet, peace upon him. So he said, we have an obligation to support 
defend and protect our society. Now, when I joined the military, it wasn't popular to be a Muslim. Although, uh, the basic records show when the Imam Muhammad picked the flag up and made those statements, a lot of Muslims, that's the, a lot of Muslims begin to appear on military records to show there is a big interest of Muslims in the military, entry, entry into the military. Uh, but it still wasn't popular yet because it wasn't abroad. And so I went in, uh, it wasn't Muslims, no accommodations. There were no places to worship, no accommodations for when you fast during the month of Ramadan, uh, those kind of things. You know, Juma prayer on Fridays, you know, they were all, all familiar with weekends because most were off on the weekends or light duly on the weekends because Christians prayed on the weekend, had their service on the weekends, Sundays, and because the Jewish communities and Seventh-day Adventists, they had their service on Saturdays, but nobody was having Friday services, so I didn't, there were no accommodations for it. And I had, at that time, because there were no services on the base, now we have them all across the base now. Uh, but th at that time, there were none. So I had to leave the base to go to a mosque for the Jumu'ah services. A wonderful thing happened here, and this is one of the things that the polit political leaders should focus on when they make these statements that, that, that weaken our country, that divide our country, uh, this community right here was targeted to be uh, the recipient of an armed protest group, an extreme white supremacist group, you know. Uh, but the neighbors heard about that. They publicized, this negative group publicized that, so our neighbors heard about it. And the neighbors decided to put signs. I was leading the delegation in Turkey. I wasn't here, but I was concerned about it. But the neighbors put signs up that said, this is a hate-free zone we stand with our neighbors, Masjid Muhammad. The neighbors did that. And the neighbors said, I just found out recently, uh, there was a Washington Post article, uh, and they, interviewed, they found the neighbor that led this campaign, and she said that they were prepared, the neighbors had already discussed, these are not Muslims, but they live all around us. They hear the Adhan, we've been calling the Adhan for over 35 years here. And they see us, they walk past us every day, we're right in the neighborhood. The neighbors, the non-Muslim neighbors had decided to if this group had come, that they were going to form a human chain in front of us to keep them away from us. And we didn't have to do anything. We, it, that's a wonderful picture. But that's the picture of how many feel about Muslims all across America. We're involved, we're involved in the city's politics. I'm on the mayor's council. We've been involved in uh, civic engagement. Uh, this city has issues with uh, jobs. So we, we're involved in, 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 in we're working with, with different organizations interfaith organizations, community organizations. Muslims are at the front. We're leading, the, we're part of the leadership team in terms of civic engagement. Uh, homelessness is an issue across America, in this city, and across America. Muslims are involved in that. Those who say Islam has no place, Islam is enemy to America, Islam is not welcome here, that is not even reality because it's first, it was here longer than they have been here, first of all. Muslims have sacrificed far beyond the sacrifices that they have made. Where was he ever on the front line for this country? in battle, never, but Muslims have done it. Far be before him, and there'll be many doing it. While he's talking, they're still doing it. And even when he passed, there'll still be Muslims serving this country. We just had an opportunity to hear about a local community here in Washington, D.C. I'll travel next to the George Washington University to speak to a very distinguished professor, Sayyid Hussain Nasser. With Professor Nasser's historic and academic background, we're hoping to better understand on a more national level the effect and impact of Muslims in America just how diverse and dynamic the emigrations have been, and just how diverse and dynamic they will continue to be as we move into the future. No religion can survive without a cultural ambience. Religion is not an abstraction. Uh, Islam produced its own Persian culture, Indian culture, Turkish culture, while being always Islamic, of course, Arabic culture, Malay, Indonesian culture, black African culture, Chinese Muslim culture, all the great zones of Islamic civilization uh, uh, have different cultures, but they have the same religion. And if Islam is going to survive in America in the same way that in Europe, in Albania, you have an Albanian Islamic culture. So it's been there for 500 years. The Muslim will have to develop an, a culture which is once Islamic and American in the same way that Albanian culture in sense is both European and Islamic. America can play a very important role American Islam, Islam in America, in countries, even like Iran, Pakistan, uh, major, uh, Egypt, is major Islamic countries, for this following reason. Uh, in all Islamic countries, whether they are 
monarchies or republics or dictatorships or religious government, doesn't make any difference. Each country has a certain set of censors that it puts on, on intellectual expression, especially when it comes to Islam. Even in Turkey, which is more open, uh, there are now, uh, as you can see, uh, certain wa uh, curtains falling down. You cannot say certain things, you cannot do certain things, especially when it comes to religion. Uh, the more secular governments, let's say Tunisia before the uh, spring, Arab Spring, I don't know, now things are changing, or Iran before the Iran Revolution. The government didn't care whether they wrote about Ghazali or Jovaini or Ibn Sina, uh, different schools of thought. But once a government is concerned with religion as being a prop of its structure, then what you say about that religion, they care about. But there's Saudi Arabia or Iran, which are two poles apart in politically, or Pakistan, or each country is in its own way. Egypt, each country in its own way. In Egypt, if you curse the Khwana Muslimin, that's fine, you get a medal. But if you die something else that the governor of Al Sisi doesn't like, then you get into trouble, obviously. In such a situation, the Muslims of America are in a very privileged position, and God expects luck from them. We're the only people who are free to write about Islamic issues in whatever way we want and whatever subject we want. I myself am a humble writer, I can write from uh, Ibn Sina to uh, some Ayatollah in Iraq, uh, everything in between. I can write from uh, philosophy to science to religion to law to mysticism, whatever I want. These are all my books and articles. I've read hundreds of articles and 50 books. And that freedom is very important because especially in this day and age, everything spreads so rapidly. It's not accidental that some of the most influential Muslim writers in the world today live in Europe and America. It's because of this issue. And so I think that the Muslims of Amer in America have a special responsibility, in addition to those that I mentioned, of being able to make use of this freedom, to be able to deal with the deeper issues that are involved in honesty, with reliance upon the Islamic tradition, and not uh, the other way around of trying to denigrate Islam and then hiding under the skirt of America or England, as some people have done from Africa and, and, and the India and so on, so you know who I'm talking about. There are various people who curse Islam and then hide in the West to be able to do so. I don't mean that, but to be an honest thinker. So you'll be read. I was in the military uh, after 9-11. I was in the military when 9-11 hit. Shortly after that, the 2003 campaign that uh, our President Bush diverted things to Iraq, uh, I was in the military. I was working in a multi-service environment uh, there, were, there were migrants, uh, maybe second, third generations, uh, who were citizens now, working with us, protecting America's properties and protecting uh, the forces. When I say the forces, the forward forces, the military members who were, who were on the lands. Uh, some of the members, when I say multi-service, I'm talking about Army, Navy, Marines, we're all working together in this department. Some of them began to make disparaging comments uh, about the Muslims, the ones who were migrant and had, that, had the uh, image uh, of what they saw as being those who attacked us, the 9-11 figure, they were in that image. And uh, I was always active as a Muslim, so they weren't towards me, people knew me, but I didn't, for some reason, they didn't target, those, target me, they targeted the other ones. And so the commander, they knew who I was, they knew I was a leader, and they asked me to do something about it. I put a document together, and I sent that to everybody's email and with the commander's permission. And the first point on this document, just to get an idea of what was in the document that I sent, the first point on here was that at that time, President Bush, his number one doctor, the doctor protecting our commander in chief, taking care of his health, that he entrusted his life to, was a Muslim. Huh? How about that? People may be uncertain about the role Muslims hold in America today. Surprisingly, many of those that you seek help in, the doctors, the lawyers, the judges, police chiefs, fire chiefs, mayors, and other elected officials could all very likely be Muslim. In fact, we have elected Muslim congressmen 
the first of which swore in to oath using the Holy Quran itself. I think the most important thing right now is for America to take a deep breath and remember our own ideals. So think about the path. Donald Trump wants to ban all Muslims from the United States. So there goes 10% of your medical professionals. What's going to happen to your healthcare system? Uh, Ted Cruz has one advisor who has praised Senator Joe McCarthy and another advisor who has called for the reestablishment of the committee that it was at the center of McCarthyism in the 1950s. So let's remember our principles of each individual is judged on their own merit and you don't group large numbers of people together and judge them all and condemn them all, which is what we would get if we went back down the McCarthy route. So stop, remember our principles, and then get out and start speaking about the importance that the United States is not for any one particular religious, ethnic, or racial group. It's based on a set of ideas, and those ideas we need to uphold. I'm here at the Islamic Center of Washington in Washington, D.C., which opened its doors to the community in the late 1950s, where President Eisenhower himself, on these very steps, delivered an opening speech. In his speech, he said that the very fabric of the Constitution, of the American hearts and minds, was to be inclusive, accepting, and embodied the local Muslim and Islamic communities. President Eisenhower also said that for America and Americans to not accept and coexist with their Muslim brothers and sisters was to go against the very fabric of what America is and was intended to be. Throughout my time here in the nation's capital, I've learned a tremendous amount, not only about the history, but about the depth of integration of the Muslim community within America. From the 1300s to the 1500s, we've seen expeditions and explorers, Moors, Muslim Arabs, and Spanish Muslims who have come to this country. We saw a large emigration during the West African slave trade of Muslims that were brought to this country and were literate and highly educated. We've seen a development, continued emigration of Muslims from multiple nationalities and ethnicities, all coexisting, living in their local communities with peace and harmony. The Muslims we see in America today are largely integrated, contributing members of society. Well integrated, not just in their local communities, but their national communities, and culturally aware of themselves and their neighbors. Although the current political landscape and media has painted quite a bleak picture of Muslims in America, with systematized and organized Islamophobia running rampant, we found in our discussions with local community members and leaders that the picture is not as bleak. Local Muslims share in ethnic diversity and are multilinguistic and multinational, but what they share and hold dearly in common is they are proud to be here in America and are proud law-abiding American citizens. As an American Muslim, I truly do hope that we can be and will be one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all, including Muslims. now in front of the newest and one of the most beautiful buildings in Washington, it is fitting that we rededicate ourselves to the peaceful progress of all men under one God. And I should like to assure you, my Islamic friends, that under the American Constitution, under American tradition, and in American hearts, this center, this place of worship, is just as welcome as could be a similar edifice of any other religion. Indeed, America would fight with her whole strength for your right to have here your own church and worship according to your own conscience. This concept is indeed a part of America, and without that concept, we would be something else than what we are. As I stand beneath these graceful arches, surrounded on every side by friends from far and near, I am convinced that our common goals are both right and promising. Faithful to the demands of justice and of brotherhood, each working according to the lights of his own conscience, our world must advance along the paths of peace. Guided by this hope, I consider it a great personal and official honor to open the Islamic Center, and I offer my congratulations to its sponsors and my best wishes to all those who enter into its use. Thank you very much.
Dwight D. Eisenhower.